how is it that these people brought involuntarily and denied their humanity have created, invented the culture that has rocked the world for hundreds of years? Black music, black dance, in different variations, you know, inventing the form of the slave narrative. What black poetry has done over the course, especially of the last century. I think that there is a relationship between being denied humanity and voice with finding voice and self-expression. <laughs> Welcome to Arts Engines. I am your host, Aaron Dworkin. And with us today is Elizabeth Alexander, who serves as president of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the nation's largest funder in arts and culture and humanities in higher education. Welcome, Elizabeth. I am so happy to be with you, Aaron. This is a treat. Oh, well, thank you so much for joining us. And you, of course, have an extraordinary bio and resume, and uh, our uh, viewers always will check those out online. So I always love to just delve right in. Um, and you wrote an uh, extraordinary article um, called uh, The Trayvon Generation uh, in The New Yorker. And I wanted to ask you, because one of the quotes that you shared was, or a quote from the article is, you said that Black creativity emerges from long lines of innovative responses to the death and violence that plague our communities. How should a reader reflect on that? And, and, and in that, what I'm also wondering is, what is this role that arts should play for us and, and for creativity, really? Well, you know, I think about that quotation on a long historical line, and I think about the parallel developments of what does it mean to come involuntarily to this country? What does it mean to come as chattel slavery? What does it mean to come defined by the law as three-fifths of a human being? What does it mean to be treated in a way that actually plays out that denial of our humanity? Okay, that's, that's the reality, right? And that has in varying ways moved forward to the present. So that Trayvon Generation article focused not only on the right now of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, uh, you know, Ahmaud Arbery, it continues, but more importantly, it goes back. So this is just a moment of inflection and, and, and the argument that, 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 that I'm making in the article about our young people, our sort of 25 years and younger people, the Trayvon generation, that these precious young people have grown up exposed to this violence in a way that we didn't, which is to say over and over and over and over again on their personal devices. So there's a way in which they have watched their violation out of the reach of the adults who love them, out of the reach sometimes of a conversation that might contextualize or soothe. And what do they make of this? What have they made of this? So I'll, I've talked and I'll talk more in a minute about the art that is of this generation that I think has been so extraordinary. But back to our long story, how is it that these people brought involuntarily and denied their humanity have created, invented the culture that has rocked the world for hundreds of years. Black music, black dance in different variations, you know, inventing the form of the slave narrative. What black poetry has done over the course, especially of the last century. I think that there is a relationship between being denied humanity and voice with finding voice and self-expression, with bringing forth that which is within us, writ large. And you know, how else, in a way, do we explain the power of 
so many different forms of black culture that as a professor, I could argue um, uh, is the finest of its genre across the board. Right. Right. Um, you know, so I, I think that that's really something to ask. That's, it's just incredible. And so, you know, a lot of our viewers are either leading organizations or potentially they're at, at various funders who are looking at all of these issues, looking at what's happening today, and they're saying, okay, there are young people of, of color out there um, who have this potential voice. We want to help them provide access. So in other words, it seems that there's a lot of young people, especially young people of color, uh, for example, not having access to um, high quality, you know, uh, music instruction or uh, classical music instruction or, or any of those types of things. What I'm curious is, what is your thought about access to training to the ability to craft one's creativity um, at the highest level? How do you think about that? Um, what do you think are some of the best ways for those in the field to empower that? Um, well, I think that, um, you know, one of the things that is amazing to me is that when denied that kind of training, when denied, um, you know, resources, access, uh, a good dance studio, you know, all of those different things, we have made extraordinary culture anyway. So uh, one of the examples that I think is really, it, it's a good one, is if you look at the birth of hip hop and you look at that as coinciding with music being taken out of the public schools. And, and that so that, you know, no more, no violins, no this, no that, you know, none of that in the New York City public schools, but you do have technology you do have people learning, you know, computers and this and that and the other thing. So, you know, if we believe that, you know, some young people, I mean, you see this every day, some, some young people, they just got something, you know, um, and they just have to express it. Uh, where does that go? And in the case of hip hop, it went to sampling, it went to cut and paste, which I think cut and paste is actually a very, very black form of self-expression of saying, you know, I take some of this, I take some of that, I make it into a, a, a new thing. It's in our cuisine, you know, we're given the leftovers and we make the most delicious pot um, with things that other people have discarded. It's in Romer Bearden's collages as a way of saying, here's a paper bag, here's a, you know, and now we have something new and the way that those look back at our most brilliant quilts. Here's a, here's a scrap, here's something that no one thought had value and you make it into something powerful in the presence. So I think that that is, is one thing that we have to remember because that kind of innovation, uh, and I wonder what you think about this, how do we bring that in when we do have um, uh, other kinds of training? You know, how, what, you know when, when a kid has a, the sensibility of a bricolore and you want them also to you know, learn the basics of classical music because presumably the two things together are a whole nother thing, right? Exactly, yeah. Um, how, do you, how do you think about um, what discipline looks like? How do you think about what rigor looks like? How do you think about all the things that people hear? You know, as a poet, I'm very aware um, that I'm, it's never quiet inside. <laughs> so like with a musician, like, you know, you're hearing, hearing, you're not even aware of everything you're hearing, but you're meant to be the radio tower, right. you know, and taking it all in. And so what I find really interesting, and that's what I was interested in, again, in this article, I was looking at Flying Lotus's music and, and the music video and um, Kendrick's All Right video and um, uh, uh, a couple of Flying Lotuses actually with different filmmakers. What are they hearing? What are they seeing? And where is the anxiety uh, around uh, our vulnerability? Where does that go? What does that look like? And there, I think we're seeing things that we couldn't have imagined. So that's kind of a really broad answer to your question. Absolutely. No, it's awesome. So, uh, so switching gears a little bit to kind of organizational structure. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, right, the, the arts landscape uh, and especially leaders of organization does not 
reflect uh, ultimately what I think many of us wish it would in terms of the breadth of cultural background race of, of our nation. Um, but there are often organizations, especially usually smaller organizations, where there are leaders of color. And a lot of times those organizations have shorter time spans because they just can't make it. They, they don't keep it going. Mm -hmm. so this issue of sustainability, to me, while, while I've always heard of it, you know, in the arts and in, in pretty much in the nonprofit sector, my sense is that it ties very closely into organizations that are either focused on issues related to people of color or led by people of color. And just wondering, what are your thoughts about that? What would you guide or any kind of key points that you would give as advice to those who are leading organizations who are looking out and going, how do I, how do I keep this sustainable? What, what can I do? Yeah, well, that's, you know, we've, we've focused a lot on that at Mellon and also um, in my work at Ford um, and thinking, too, not only about under-resourced organizations led by people of color, but also um, the real vision that um, artist-led organizations can, can offer us. I mean, uh, I see the book that's behind you. <laughs> um, so, you know, not every artist wants to build a house, you know, um, but for the ones who want to build a house, what I find very exciting about that is that very often there are angles of vision um, uh, and also I, I characterize artists as having a kind of thrift which is very useful because again, we make use of everything. You know, that's just, I'd like to me, that's one of the things that it is to make art, is to make use of everything. And I think that that absolutely translates to how you think about what are the resources that you have when you're trying to build a house. Now that said, to the resource of, of cash money and, and, to, and to where, you know, philanthropy comes in, um, uh, I think that, you know, what, what we've been trying to do is be more supportive over time uh, to organizations, but also um, to lift up, not just with the necessarily the grant, but also with helping people, like sometimes, People don't even have the resources to come together with other people around the country, let's say, who are doing, trying to do the thing that they're trying to do. So, you know, two art spaces I really love that we support, the Underground Museum in Los Angeles and Next Haven in New Haven. You know, those two people need to, they need to be family. They need to know each other. They need to see how they've solved problems. And so to be able to be helpful with networking people um, as well, I think is really important. I think also the question of sustainability um, is one that we might answer in some interesting ways. You know, I think that if we only look to um, big old institutions that have been around forever, that have wealthy boards, that have, you know, sometimes they should be asking different questions about sustainability. Like, what does it mean for them to live forever and be a dinosaur? What does it mean for them to live forever and be placing a version of the culture in amber, as opposed to seeing themselves with the privilege of their sustainability as being dynamic, civic organizations who are serving a public? So that's a really important conversation that goes along with thinking about um, how to be helpful to places that are, um, that are under-resourced and have a different vision. So one of the things I think is really important is how do the, do, the, do the biggers look to the example, learn from the example of what others are making. The final thing I'll say about sustainability, um, and this isn't, um, you know, kind of, you know, I think we always think that we want the organization to live forever. And I have also seen organizations that resources notwithstanding did something very, very powerful. You see this in like literary journals sometimes. I, I know that history better. Where, you know, these five extraordinary poets came together in the East Village in 1957 and they made this magazine and there are only three copies of it. But it changed the way that we thought about what poetry could be or how we think about literary community. That's an extreme example, but it's an important one because sometimes we lose um, a, a lot of energy thinking that what we're supposed to do is keep on going when maybe we've actually made our powerful contribution and need to evolve ourselves. 
Oh, absolutely. There's wanted to kind of delve into you. <laughs> uh, and by that, you know, um, you are, you know, you helm, you know, one of the leading, you know, um, uh, foundations surrounding, you know, the arts in the country. Um, but you, you know, you must work incredibly long hours. There are other things you could do. What drives your passion for this work? Um, was there something that happened when you were young that, that made you realize the power of the, you know, the written word, the, you know, the architecture of language specifically or broader in the arts? Just wondering what kind of um, took you into this understanding of why the arts are so important to us? Well, I think, you know, there's the, there are the arts and then, and there's making the art and then there's educating about the art. And now there is finding a, a ways to be helpful in philanthropy with, with the arts and with higher education as well. Um, and um, I think in my family, um, there was always a, a powerful sense of fighting for justice, of being generations of race people, you know, who, you know, just, you had a responsibility to be helpful to your larger community. You had a responsibility to name injustice and figure out with your particular tools. So I think I might have thought, you know, maybe I was going to be a lawyer, you know, maybe I thought I was going to be a civil rights lawyer, because that seemed like a thing I could see and a thing I could do and a thing that you would do if you went to college and you did a good job. Um, but I always, I started out dancing. That was my early art form. And so in that dancing, I learned everything about discipline, um, about discipline through uh, pain. <laughs> um, you know, that it's, it's actually not easy to make art, which was a lesson to me when I made other art forms, but also it's part of what gives me respect for artists. Um, is you know the obsessive work that goes into it even to be adequate um and i think a kind of you know it is not for everyone it is not for most people i actually i do think that enjoying the arts is something that i want to belong to every human being i do believe that i don't think every human being like should be an artist or could be an artist i actually don't believe that. I know that's awful. That doesn't mean that I don't think everybody, I think every child should, you know, have music lessons and dance lessons and have a chance to like, let's see. But I think it's okay to love something and find that, and here's what I found, that I devoted everything to dance and I was pretty good, but I wasn't good enough. So what do you do with that drive and that discipline and that devotion? you go find the thing you're supposed to be doing, you know? Um, and for me also growing up in, in, you know, there was school, but then there was the dance community. So being around people who, again, you know, were not conventional, um, who made their lives in different ways, um, uh, who had, you know, their own shapes and directions to the ways that they did things. That was very, I grew up in a very tolerant family, but that was another important lesson in being wide open to people. And so I think that in a way, being wide open to people, I, like my love for human beings, my love for human beings, but also for black people and black culture, because we have survived and made something glorious that I revere and sing that song every single day. So I think all of that is animating to thinking, okay, so now it's in making a written thing. And now it's in teaching, you know, some university students who will go away feeling like, I understand why Gwendolyn Brooks is transcendent and has a secret to life, you know? I understand, just to take it to Detroit, why Robert Hayden, you know, is the greatest lyric poet of the 20th century. You know, I'm gonna hold those winter Sundays inside of me because it will be meaningful to me at some point like I'm so proud to have taught folks like that and so now to be able to do this in philanthropy and to say that you know that which I think has the most nourishing value and power and insight and necessity of anything is something that I can help support and just like be with folks feels like a huge privilege oh wow 
Well, this has been incredible. Unfortunately, we are just about out of time. One last quick question, but just wondering, you know, for the people who are watching, whether they be a practitioner or, you know, an administrative leader, um, someone who's in this sphere that relates to um, the arts, as well as those who really want to help make a difference, especially in the world we're living in now. Is there any kind of overarching either theme or driving thing that you would share with people to say, keep this in mind, you know, day in, day out, things get hard, keep this in mind? What I would say is take heart because what you make, what you do, what you support, what you make available to others is what we need to get through the darkness that we are in. We are in very divided times in this country, as we know. We are in tremendously vulnerable times. We are in the midst of a global pandemic that is, as we know, also you know, showing us laying bare uh, the inequity in this society and killing folks. But I do believe that for those people who are the makers and caretakers of arts and culture, that is the light that will show us the way out of the darkness. So to take heart in knowing that I, I, I think that those, all those people who are doing that are essential workers. And we, we the society, we, 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 we need that. So just, it's a thank you. Elizabeth Alexander, you truly are one of the great arts engines in our field that is powering human creativity. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. This was the joy of my day. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you so much.